Well, hello, church. Uh, hello, Avon. Hello, online church family. Uh, we're so thankful that you guys are here. It's a, it's a joy to be able to gather like this and worship, lift our voices to God with these amazing truths and uh, spend time in his word and let him encourage us. Um, so thanks for being here. Um, I've done this alone before when the room's empty. Not the same, so thanks. Um, when, when we lived in Los Angeles, we were about five minutes from a theme park with massive roller coasters. Uh, do I have any roller coaster fans here? Anybody that likes, I'm not talking about Disney, I'm talking about like Six Flags, the scarier the better, sort of. Okay, those roller coasters are fantastic when you're 15 years old. <laughs> and your body can handle 19 Gs while they shoot flames at you. I used to go when I was a kid and I'd finish out the day like a hummingbird, no trouble whatsoever, riding rides named things like the evaporator, you know, where you could get a concussion and whiplash and wet your pants all in the same two minutes. You're like, wow, far out, this is a fun, fun day. I paid for this. Well, fast forward, I was 37 years old, which is basically dead in Six Flags language. <laughs> and I had a 13-year-old that I was mentoring, and he really wanted to go to Six Flags, never been to Six Flags, never ridden a roller coaster. So I thought, okay, well, let's go for it. We showed up, and it was the off-season, it was also midweek, and so it was empty. And he said, oh, I wanna go on that one. And I said, well, what's that one? He said, oh, it's called, you know, whatever, Satan's Nose Hair. And I'm like, ooh, that sounds <laughs> not good times. I don't know if I wanna ride Satan's Nose Hair. He said, oh, come on, it'll be good. There was no line, and there was no one on our train car, roller coaster car, just the two of us which meant that we got in for the ride, and when it went its first lap, when you'd normally stop and get off, they brought it to a stop, and they said, you wanna go again? And I'm going, no. And he goes, yeah! And so they let her rip. We went seven times straight on Satan's nose hair. At lap six, my small intestine had made its way up through my right nostril. Now I know why they call it Satan's nose hair. And it was a miserable experience. When you and I go through roller coasters, one lap, two laps, or whatever, we can get all the kicks we want out of it, have all the joy and the fun that we want. But if you've ever experienced the ongoing roller coaster, it's not the same experience. When you go through life, it's kind of the same way. If you have a, a roller coaster experience, I mean, kind of a turbulent season in your life, it's a weekend, it's a week, it's even a couple of months, you and I can tolerate it. You and I can get through it. You may not wanna go do it again, but you can make it. But what do you and I do when the roller coaster of life feels like it's unending? Like you're never gonna get off of it. And you just wanna pull the e-brake with everything in you but, you, but you can't. I've had many, many a season of that in my life. In fact, when I look over my life, I look over and, and am finely tuned to the pain. I'm really keenly aware of the hardships and the trials, often one after the other. And what I've come to discover is prolonged suffering has a way of sucking our hearts dry, our souls dry. It also has a way of, of, of bringing some distance between us and God. Now, we're in this series called I Am Strong that Pastor John kicked off last week with one of the best messages on suffering and what God can do in and through it that I've ever heard in my entire life. If you missed it, you need to go back and you need to watch. He, he reminded us that God's power is perfected in weakness. 
there's actually something special that God can do in our suffering, in our weakness, that just really doesn't happen in any other set of circumstances. He reminded us that God's a healer. He's always a healer. He's gonna heal me and he's gonna heal you, either in this life or in the life to come. But in this life, if he's not providing the healing that you desire or that you want right away, and if the suffering and the hurt and the pain and the temptation and this, that, and the other thing, the brokenness of our world is, is more front and center to you, what do you do? We, we want to come alongside for a few weeks as we have this conversation about suffering. We wanna see what God has for us. John wrote the book, I Am Strong, and if you haven't got the book, get the book. We have made available a free copy for all of you, his audio book on I Am Strong. You go to cp.news and there's a tab right there in the middle that says grab that audio book. You click that, you can download that for free. I encourage you to do it. Because some of the stuff that we're discussing here for a few weeks, you may wanna do a deep dive on longer than just a few weeks and longer than we have time to hear. But what do you and I do when the suffering is prolonged? What do we do? How is God gonna sustain me and you when we're not necessarily gonna receive deliverance from God? Is there the opportunity to find refuge in him while we wait? I believe so. Multiple times in scripture, God reminds me and you that he is our refuge. Here's a handful. Psalm chapter 18. Psalm chapter 18, verses one and two. I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Jesus desires that you find refuge in him. God's heart is not that you would stay out there and alone and exposed, but rather in the midst of the suffering, in the midst of the pain and the hurt, you would find a safe place, some relief, some comfort, some protection, some strength from him as you retreat into him, as you relate to him. Psalm 46 says it similarly, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. And then Psalm 91 says, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Do, do you consider your relationship with God that way, that he is your refuge, your strong tower, your shelter, your stronghold, that in the midst of whatever it is that you're facing, but especially in those prolonged seasons of suffering that you can run to him, that you can crawl up in his lap, that with those big, strong, powerful arms of his, that he loves to just wrap you up. He's our refuge in this suffering. First and foremost, there's a, there's a picture that um, has kind of been around for a while. The first time I saw it was in Ikea, and uh, not a real art place, but it was, it was a good picture, and it stuck with me, and, and I wanna share it with you. This is a picture of a lighthouse. This is an actual photo. This is in Photoshopped, and there's a guy there, the lighthouse keeper, and if you go look this up online and then zoom in on that guy, what you'd find is the guy standing there is standing there kind of nonchalant. Yeah, what's the big deal? I'm in a massive storm in a lighthouse and I'm just gonna stand here just like this. Whatever. I mean, it was mind-blowing to me. 
You know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. I mean, look at that. I got a whole bunch of questions about how they build a light, like, lighthouse like that in the first place. But what the story is behind this is that the lighthouse keeper in there heard the helicopter that was flying by that took this photograph, and he just came out to see the helicopter, see what was going on. He knows what's around him. He knows what he's surrounded by, and he doesn't seem to care. He's in the middle of that crazy storm, and yet he's got refuge. He's safe. He knows that this particular refuge is impenetrable. Therefore, he can be quite calm and nonchalant knowing that those waves are not gonna overtake him. Now, what if, what if this lighthouse keeper in this particular uh, set of waves, the storm that's going on that you see right there, what if that lighthouse keeper just went, you know, I'm done with this lighthouse. I'm gonna take my chances. And he throws a canoe out and jumps in the canoe just to try to give the waves a, a good test drive. How well do you think he's gonna fare? Not very well, is he? He's gonna get consumed. He's gonna get flipped upside down. He's gonna get sucked down. The chances are, if he took his chances against the waves, he would drown. Why do we do the same thing in the midst of our waves, in the midst of our storms, in the midst of our suffering, when God is offering us a completely impenetrable refuge in him, so often we're like, oh, whatever, God, I'm gonna canoe it from here. Yeah, I see the storms, I see the waves, but rather than turning to you, Lord, I'm gonna turn away from you. I've got what I need to get through the suffering without you. Thanks for the offer of the refuge, God, but I'll be okay. For whatever reason, that tends to be our pattern, unless you've opted for that multiple times and found it lacking, eventually you go, okay, I'm not gonna do that anymore. We get to the end of ourself, thank you very much, and then we finally go, okay, Lord, I do want that refuge in you. I, I want you to be my strong tower, because there's nothing in the world that I can find that can protect me like you do. I can't protect me like you do, so I'm gonna turn to you. There's a passage in the book of Exodus that I would love for us to look at today together. In Exodus chapter 17, but the approach of it, I wanna just kinda fill you in a little bit. Do you know how much the people of God went through I mean, like over and over and over again, the trials that they faced, the hardships that they faced, the suffering that they faced. Sometimes it was a result of their own doing. Sometimes it was the hands of other people that led to their suffering. You name it, they experienced it one thing after another. Well, for 400 years, God's people have been held captive as slaves in Egypt. Now, God uses Moses to go rescue the people of God out of slavery in Egypt and sends them on a journey to the promised land, this land that God had promised for them. So they've been rescued from slavery, they're journeying to the promised land, but they are not there yet. Does that sound familiar? This is the historic story of the Exodus, but it's also all of our spiritual story. You see, you and I have been rescued from the slavery of sin by God through Jesus Christ. He was the rescuer that came and freed us out of captivity, out of sin. And we're on this journey now to the promised land, life eternal, in heaven, someday. Can't wait for it, can you? It's gonna be phenomenal. But we're not there yet. And in the meantime, we live in a broken down, beat up world affected by the curse of sin. 
And so suffering and hardship is kind of a regular part of life. It's just kind of constantly in the backdrop of your life and my life. And yet, what, what God's people started to learn, I think what God was teaching his people was to choose to turn to him in the midst of suffering, in the midst of the challenges. Why is that so hard? It's so hard for me just to simply have my first response be to turn to God in the challenges and the hardships. Man, that's tough for me. You're probably way better at it than me, but I'm not good at it. I've had to learn it over time. God's people had to learn it over time. And there's just this course of events in Exodus chapter 17 that I would love to share with you. There's some patterns that emerge that teach us a lot about how we tend to operate in the midst of suffering, what tends to be the way that we turn away from God rather than to him, and some good lessons to learn about how Moses operates, and in the middle of it, some real blessings that God has offering refuge to his people when they're experiencing one challenge after another. Exodus chapter 17, verse one. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin. Let me just stop right there. If you ever find yourself in a place called the desert of sin, probably not gonna be real good times. Probably a place that you'd want to avoid. Now the thing is, they've been rescued out of slavery in Egypt. They're on their way to the promised land. Moses has put his staff in the Red Sea and it parted and God's people got through. Their enemies have been destroyed. They get out into the desert wilderness and they're thirsty. They're already thirsty. There's no water to drink because they're out in a desert. But what did God do? He provided water from them. There was bitter water, but he made it drinkable water. God did. Then they're hungry. What did God do? He provides manna and quail from heaven. And then this happens right there. So he's already provided what? Rescue from their enemies, deliverance from their enemies. He's already provided water once. He's provided food for them. He's clearly taking care of them. But then they encounter this in the desert of sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So again, second time, no water. So they quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. (laughs) You can hear the tone. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? And what happens right here is, even today, I find in me, maybe in you, kind of a common pattern when we're facing hardships, challenges, prolonged suffering, we're in the desert season. There is a lack of something that we desire or want, maybe it's comfort, maybe it's health, whatever it is. And then we're thirsty in the midst of going without in the midst of having to pour ourselves out, we go thirsty, we go hungry. Sometimes literally, sometimes physically, but often spiritually. Prolonged suffering and hardship has a way of sucking your spirit dry. And when your heart goes dry, when your spirit goes dry, then we tend to get kind of whiny and complainy and blamey. We, we try to maybe affix the blame on someone else. They go after Moses. We find that they even begin to doubt God. Is God even among them or not? And this is also a common thing. 
that, that we don't just complain and whine about stuff, but we, we begin to wonder in our prolonged hardship and suffering, we go, God, do you even care? Are you even around? Pastor John talked about that last week. God, have you left the building? God, why aren't you doing anything? This is the normal way of operating when we're facing suffering. They've got a legitimate problem, don't they? They do, right? Moses is leading these people. There's probably, the guesstimate is somewhere around two million Jewish people that Moses is leading through the wilderness, including men, women, and children. That's a lot of people. That's not just a couple thousand. That's a ton of responsibility. And when you're out in the desert and there's no water, there's nothing to drink, You bet you've got a legitimate problem. They had a real problem, but they had the wrong response. How about you? How do you tend to respond when the going gets tough? How do you tend to respond when you're subject to challenges, sin, health challenges, Suffering, pain, hurt, relational friction, a lack of something. What's your response? See, they could have responded and gone, you know what? God's provided in the past. Let's look to him again and see if he'll provide again. That that could have been a good response. They, They could have prayed They could have even gone to Moses with not just complaints, but some solutions. Hey, Mo, if you haven't noticed, two million of us here, no water. So 10 of us have decided we could go out and look for some. And so we're gonna do that. We're offering our help, but instead they blamed Moses and did nothing. It's the wrong response. And they did not turn to God. Moses, on the other hand, Moses, on the other hand, I love what he does. Look at verse four. Then Moses cried out to the Lord. What am I to do to these people, with these people? He probably wanna do something to them also. (laughs) They're almost ready to stone me, he said. See, I, I think it's not just good leaders that are constantly turning to God. I think just good followers of his, their first response, their first inclination is turn to the Lord. But especially when stuff is tough, especially when you have a need. How about you? Who is your first go-to when you're struggling? That's a good question for you. When you're struggling, who is the first one that you turn to? Is it your job? Is it your smarts? Is it your bank account? Is it your talent? Is it your own strength? Is it a particular sin that's now become a habit that allows you to numb out from the pain of your suffering? I've been there and done that. Who's your first go-to? I think Moses over time had learned that in these sufferings, in these challenges, God wants to be the refuge. He wants to be the safe place. Look look at what he does, verse five. The Lord answered Moses, go out in front of the people, take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I'll stand there before you by the rock at Horeb, strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. That's pretty cool. I don't know if there was an artesian spring underneath the rock and God did the miracle there and the spring welled up after uh, Moses tapped it there. Um, I don't know if the rock was so tired of all the complaining of the Israelites that the rock just started crying a bunch and here comes water to drink. 
All we know is God does a miracle. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? God provided for them. They turned to him, and God provided their tangible need. You know, God knows your tangible needs. He knows you need things like air. You need medical attention. And he's got what you need on a tangible level. And he's got what you need on a heart level. This case, he's providing water for his people. But you know, want to know something interesting about this? This particular moment is actually tied into the New Testament. In John chapter seven, Jesus is on earth doing his earthly ministry. And for hundreds of years, the Jewish people had been celebrating these festivals or feasts. Three times a year, the the, the people of God would make a pilgrimage or a journey from wherever they lived to Jerusalem to celebrate these different feasts and festivals. And these festivals commemorated or celebrated important things that the people of God needed to remember about the character and nature of God. And in John chapter seven, something interesting happens. One of those feasts, one of those festivals is going on and it's called the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Feast of Tabernacles, it celebrated how God provided for his people while they were wandering in the wilderness. And guess what? On the last day, on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, the climax of the festival, they celebrated when God provided water from a rock. And on that day, in John chapter 7, verse 37 and 38, Jesus gets up on the day that they're celebrating this moment that we looked at in Exodus. Jesus gets up to the crowd and says, if anyone is thirsty, come to me and drink. It will be like fountains, rivers of living water are flowing from within your soul. God provided for his people back in the Old Testament, often in tangible ways. But Jesus is hammering home here, what I have got for you, what I'm gonna do for you, what my spirit ultimately is gonna do for you is something in your heart and in your soul. And it's actually more valuable to you than even water. Jesus says, I I wanna be your refuge. I I wanna be the strength to your soul. And when you and I have the blood flowing through our veins that's filled with the spirit of Jesus, the word of Jesus, when you and I through our veins have the words of Paul and the words of Moses, the word of God coursing through our veins, then man, bring on all the waves that you want because the refuge that he can provide in your heart and your soul is such a comfort. The refuge of God does two pretty powerful things. It protects you from the lies when you retreat back to the Lord. In the midst of your suffering, what the enemy starts to whisper is a whole bunch of lies. God's not real. God doesn't care. You don't have enough faith. A whole bunch of lies. You're suffering all because of you. God's punishing you. God hates you. God doesn't exist. Life's always gonna be like this. There's nothing better around the corner. The lies just keep coming. But when you retreat back to the word of God and you retreat back to Jesus, his spirit is gonna affirm in you what is truth versus lies. And when you're suffering, I I know you need this because I know I need it. When I'm suffering, 
There's times where I just need to come to the Lord and go, remind me again about who you are. Would you please remind me of the truth of my circumstances? Would you remind me of the truth of your character and nature, God? Because the volume on the lies is all I'm hearing right now. Would you remind me again about me and how you see me? Because maybe I'm suffering right now as a result of my sinful choices and it's been prolonged now. Can you remind me again that you will never leave me or forsake me? And he's a refuge in that regard. He'll protect you. And then he'll also refresh you with that same truth. He wants to refresh your heart and refresh your soul in the middle of the suffering. And that's how he becomes the refuge, bolstering what is true about your circumstances, bolstering what is true about him, bolstering what is true about you and other people so that you're not just tossed back and forth by the wind and the waves of suffering. Man, this has been a lifelong learning for me to turn to Jesus and let him strengthen me. It's been a lifelong journey of turning to him as my refuge. Because like many of us, my natural default isn't to that. My natural default is just to kinda go the opposite direction, do my own thing, try to get through it, grit my teeth on my own. My natural father made some choices where he took off when I was three or four or something. I don't remember a whole bunch of it. But I know that it had an effect on my heart. I remember real vividly in high school, there was a deep, what I can now only describe as like emotional weight, sadness, almost a depression. I mean, it was dark. It was a bleak sort of emotional state that I just couldn't seem to shake. That when the enemy is really going after me, even today, he brings me back to that real sad, sad, deep soul sadness sort of place. When I was in college, just about to start my freshman year of college, um, I woke up the day that we were gonna leave to go to college and uh, out of nowhere, I had a massive grand mal seizure and fell through a glass shower door. And that led to me to this day having epilepsy. And the seizures are bad enough get really sore afterwards. I lose a couple days of memory leading up to it, bite through my tongue. But it's often the, the, the fall or wherever you happen to be when you have the seizure and go unconscious that ends up leading to more of the damage, including one time where I had one in a car and rolled a car down a small hill. And it just made me nervous all the time. When am I gonna have one? And am I gonna have this my whole life? I think about leading up to getting married and my adoptive dad that meant the absolute world to me. Shortly before I got married, he was gonna be the best man in my wedding and that's when he had a massive heart attack at 48 years old and we lost him and I knew too much to doubt that God existed, but it just made me not like him very much, if I'm real honest, in that season. It triggered some of the seizures coming back. Through my adult years then, my ministry years, sometimes the hurt to the suffering I've experienced has come from other Christians in the church. How am I supposed to reconcile that? How have you? Thankfully, 
I know God's good, even when his people aren't so good. And my hope, my refuge is in him, not in other people, not in myself. Pastor John and I were both ministering in a community in northern Arizona when a massive wildland fire went through and killed 19 firefighters all at once. Six of them went to our church. I did 14 memorials in three days. How am I supposed to process that? I've sat with countless people have they lost loved ones was in Phoenix Children's Hospital and watched a dear family with their nine-year-old who'd had a bad accident pass away right in front of me there in the hospital. And for weeks, I would wake up with the image in my head of that sweet little boy. The last 18 months or so, I've had a number of dear friends pass away My wife lost her dad. My natural father, who'd come back in the picture, he passed away. And we lost my grandmother. It's just been a season of loss this last 18 months. And so that's why I say these prolonged seasons of suffering, I look back and we started to joke, you know? 30 years isn't a season. That's a lifetime. And if you and I try to canoe this thing alone, and if we don't learn to turn to God, to Jesus as our refuge, so that he can protect us and refresh us with his spirit and his word, we're not gonna get through the suffering. But he can replenish whatever suffering has robbed from me and you. He can, and he does, in supernatural ways. If you turn to him, if you turn to him, if you retreat into him, find your refuge in him, abide in him. There's some of those things that only he can do. That's what I've learned. But what I've also learned is God's my refuge, but in his goodness to me and you, there's also something to be said and having some companions around you that are non-whiny givers and encouragers. Raise your hand if you got at least one amazing encourager in your world. Thank you, Jesus. Give us more of those sorts of people. What goes on to happen in this particular story God's provided, provided water from a rock, and then guess what almost immediately happens? They get ambushed by a foreign people. Again, one thing after another. Here comes another trial. Really? Yep. And the Amalekites go to war with them. Moses immediately has to focus them on this battle. He sends Joshua out to fight the battle, and he grabs two friends and says, we're going to the top of the hill. And they take the staff of God to the top of this hill, and Moses adopts a posture of prayer. This, hands up in the air, was a posture of prayer. And then he had the staff that God had done some miraculous things through in his hands. And the scriptures record, if you continue to read, that while his hands are up and he's in prayer, the Jewish people were winning. But when he would grow tired and his hands would fall down, the Amalekites would win. And so his two friends, one named Aaron and one named Hur, come up on either side of him. They pull up a rock and say, Moses, have a seat. And all through the night, one on one side, one on the other, Aaron and her prop up the hands of Moses that he can continue to spiritually contend for his people in prayer all through the night, and the people of God win the battle. And that image is one of my favorites in all of scripture. When you... 
seek first God, when you turn first to God in your suffering, and then you focus on being a giver, you focus on caring for other people, being a refuge to brothers and sisters in Christ, friends and family, being a refuge even to people that don't know Jesus, I guarantee you, when you have a time of need, you will be surrounded by people that are gonna prop you up. That's the goodness of God too. He'll provide refuge for you directly in your spirit through his word and through his Holy Spirit. He'll also provide refuge for you oftentimes through some really amazing friends. We were made for relationship first and foremost with our God and then we were made for relationship with each other. Who is someone you can be a tangible refuge to with the hand you extend and the words you extend? I know that you're already, I know some of you already, you you are givers. You're those encouragers. You are a tangible picture of refuge that God desires to be with people, to your family, to your friends, even to strangers. I've been blessed over the years because Jesus, I just keep turning to him and he refreshes me deep down in here. And then when I am a mess, he says, I'm gonna give you some Jesus with skin. Because you need that. Here's a list of some of my Jesuses with skin. Jesus is one of them, and my wife, Anna, and then my mom, and my son, Braddock, and my son, Brody, and my daughter, Leilani, and my friend, Logan, and Bo, and John, and Michael, and Eddie, and John, and Julia, and Mike, and Tim, and Chris, Phil, Brian, Aaron, Landon, Joey, Paul, Jack, Ty, Kirk, Rick, Trey, Rod, Andy, Sean, Brian, Connor, Colton, dot, 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 because the list actually goes on. I am most richly blessed. Some of the names on that list are people sitting right here in this room. You wanna talk about suffering, you should have sat through this talk last night. It was awful from my perspective. I don't know what people would have said about it, but it was one of those I felt awful about it while I'm doing it. If you've never had the pleasure of that experience, (laughs) I don't encourage it. I just, I couldn't get thoughts together What was coming out wasn't what I wanted. It wasn't even what was on my notes. And I just, I'm fumbling through the whole thing. I woke up this morning, I'd retooled it all last night, and I'm like, okay, Lord, I think I got it figured out. Sorry about that, God. And he's like, oh, that's fine, that's whatever. (laughs) But I'm still feeling bad about it coming into today. About five minutes before I walked out, during worship, your pastor, my pastor, John, comes running down backstage to encourage me and to pray for me. I got a text from my son two minutes before I'm coming out. You got this, Dad. And it's like God's just speaking right through people, saying, come into me, retreat into me, turn the volume down on the lies, crank the volume up on the truth. He can do that. So how does God provide refuge? Well, he provides it two powerful ways, some truth to cling to and someone's hand to hold. We see it here in this passage. You've seen it in your own life. When you retreat into him, he's gonna give you some truth about your circumstances. He's gonna give you truth about him. He's gonna give you truth about you. He's gonna give you truth about other people if you turn to him. He's also gonna provide someone's hand to hold. And as we close our time today, I'd love to lean into the truth that he has for us as well as some hands to hold and just spend a little bit of time in prayer together united together. Maybe just to drive home that imagery, if you don't mind, 
Would you stand if you're able right where you are? Thank you. Avon, you too. We can hit the Purell station later, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to ask if you're okay, if you'd reach out and take the hand of the people next to you, even across the aisles, if you're able, so that we're just one big connected family. If you're there online and you're alone, then I'm reaching out and grabbing your hand in heart and in spirit. If you're watching online with some other people, grab their hands. And I would just love to pray for us in the midst of the roller coaster that we're all on. Pray that we'd find our refuge in him. That he'd provide a hand for you to hold and also bring someone to you to whom you can be a hand, a tangible refuge as well. And so gracious heavenly father is your church, your people. Lord, there's times where we uh, turn away from you in the suffering and we're sucked dry in our suffering and we get more whiny and complaining and blamey. There's times, Lord, where we uh, doubt that you're even there or you even care. Forgive me for doing that. Help us all, Lord, to turn to you and to hear you, the way, the truth, and the life speak to our hearts and our souls. Would you crank down the lies that maybe the enemy's throwing at us in our prolonged season of suffering and hardship? Would you crank up the volume on the truth? Remind us again of your love for us. Remind us again of our relationship with you. Remind us again of what you've done with our past. Remind us again of what you're doing right here and right now. Remind us again of what is to come in this life and certainly in the life to come in your presence. And God, as we're holding the hand of someone to the left and right of us, we just thank you for the hands you've provided for us. Because there are those times where we need relationship with other people. And thank you for the errands and the hers and Thank you for the family members, the friends that you've brought, but also, Lord, help us be those givers. Help us be those fillers. Help us be those encouragers. The way that you are a giver, the giver. You gave your one and only son. Jesus, you gave your life. Where we'll find our refuge in you and you'll carry us through. We trust in that. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen, amen. You can grab a seat.